Chris Rice. We've seen him take his shirt off in the garage, yeah, doing we, a little dance. He's trying to stop that, by the way. <laughs> like, in that. I don't know. I really don't know why that started. Like, <laughs> it, it started at Talladega when we won a couple years ago. everyone and welcome to episode 12 of Mics Are Hot. I'm Alanis King and alongside me is my favorite Monica Palumbo. Hey everybody! We're so excited you're here. We've got so much to talk about. Not only, well, Bristol was crazy, but we're heading in to Coda this weekend. So, so much going on and two totally different races. Very different races. And you know, we've had a busy morning already. Monica's printer doesn't work. <laughs> I don't own blinds. So my my lighting changes every five seconds and we just chase the lighting. We are just having a good time this morning. And Portia's already joining us this morning. Look, Portia's she's got I can her. see her in the screen. <laughs> Portia's got her little face right here. Oh my goodness. This is such an exciting morning. And today we have AJ Allmendinger on the show. AJ drives full-time in the Xfinity Series for Colleague Racing, and he does some Cup Series races, too. AJ is a road course specialist, and that is the theme of our show today. And who better to have on a show about that than someone who has double-digit road course wins, like 11. So I think that he can give us just a little bit of insight on these road courses. Um, but no, we're so excited to have him on, to talk with him, to hear what he has to say about Coda, because we know he's had some success there as well. But before we get to Coda, I feel like we should talk about this past weekend at Bristol. And if you did not watch Bristol, specifically in the Cup Series, that was a wild race. The tire compound was just not agreeing with the racetrack, right? And yeah. so everybody was having this incredible tire wear. People were popping tires. By the end of a tire run, which was not very long, everyone was ice skating. It was the wildest race. You would see someone in the lead and then their car would just quit going, right? <laughs> and then they would just get passed by a bunch of people. It was wild it was so entertaining monica what did yeah. you think about it i thought it was awesome you know you hear it from both sides either you love it or you hate it what i thought was cool is you really got to see the veterans drivers um they survived because it was kind of like going back to old school racing right you have to you have to save your tires and nowadays i feel like everybody is full force ahead well if you look back at old school stock car racing these drivers are way more in control with, with conserving their tire wear. And so they really had to do that in Bristol. So, you know, you could see some of the younger drivers, they might be full force there for a while, but then they all went back, you know, to the end of the line. So there at the very end, you have, you have Denny Hamlin, Martin Trix, Jr. Keselowski, all there finishing one, two, and three. Um, and those drivers seem to like it. You know, it was a, it was a different race. They seem to enjoy it to have more control, I don't know if they would want that much tire fall off each and every weekend, but I think they thought it spiced it up a little bit. You know, uh, Denny Hamlin won this race and I watched his podcast the other day and I think it was on his podcast where they talked about the evolution of the tires in the cup series in particular, which is you have tires and then the teams make the cars more aggressive. And so the tires wear more. And then Goodyear has to make the tires stronger. And then the teams make the car more aggressive and the tires wear more. And Goodyear makes the tires stronger. So you just have this situation where these tires are just so durable that you don't have that old school fall off anymore. And whatever happened at Bristol gave us that fall off. So it was a very old school style race. I just don't think they were expecting it to fall off that much. These were the same Goodyear tires they used in the fall. Mm -hmm. They had used PJ Which one in the wild. fall. And they put resin mm -hmm. down here uh, this past weekend. So what is wild too is in the middle of the race, they have a Goodyear press conference. So you know <laughs> that it is everyone's flabbergasted at what's going on, but I thought it was so exciting to see how people adjust live in the middle of, of the race. And adjusting live is such a good point because another thing Denny talked about was if you ran the same race again the next day, the teams would be better with the tires the next day because they yeah. would have spent all night 
figuring out how to change their car setup to more fit those tires. And so it was just unexpected. There wasn't enough time to change up and fix it, but I don't think it needed to be fixed. Denny Hamlin's crew chief, Chris Gabehart, he said, hats off to Goodyear. That was awesome. <laughs> I agree. I absolutely love when you have a change up in strategy and a change up in how you have to drive and you have that tire fall off because it is so exciting when you're on a really small track and one driver is a lot faster than another driver and they're just slingshotting by each other because, oh, wow, it, it was so good. <laughs> and I think it is a good time to do Fan questions. Every single time we have an episode, Monica and I say, hey, do y'all have any questions for us on Mics or Hot? We usually post it on our Twitter and Instagram accounts. So if you want to go submit fan questions for us, just look for us online and look for those posts where you can submit. Our first question is from Master of Light 24. That is a very powerful name. Who was your <laughs> inspiration in wanting to be a part of racing and how much of an impact do they have on you today? Monica, you first. Well, for me, there wasn't one person that got me into NASCAR. I got into NASCAR on my own. So there wasn't that person that I looked up to. But once I got into the sport and got to know everybody, I have just respected and enjoyed um, watching Jamie Little. So, you know, just seeing how she has networked and she's knowledgeable and she keeps her elbows out when she, she has a stance where she needs to be. She's well-respected in the sport. Um, so she's a role model to me, a mentor, she has her door open anytime I need to ask questions or, or talk with her. So she's someone that I truly look up to uh, in the sport. That is such a good answer. Her voice was going away this weekend so and I felt bad. so bad for her because when you're, when your voice is going away, it hurts your throat so badly. And I was like, oh man, she is fighting through it right now. Yeah, she was, she was, but she, she's a fighter, man. She is, she works, I feel like a hundred jobs at a hundred miles an hour. She's a mom. She's a wife. She's, she's trying to do it all. Mm -hmm. And that she does so it all. true. <laughs> I also don't have one specific person because I've talked about on the show before I became a NASCAR person by chance. We got free tickets to a race. I didn't want to go. I went, I was like, this is the best thing in the world. So I would say the one person who really helped me understand NASCAR was our family friend who was also at that race. His name is Steve McLean. And we sat down and he walked me through everything that was going on on track. Cause I had no idea what was happening. I didn't know who Dale senior was. I didn't know who Dale jr. Was I didn't know who anybody was. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Boom. Right. Wow. That's wild. He walked me through what was happening on track and then for the next however many years, I decided after that race, I'm going to watch every single NASCAR race that ever happens from this moment onward. From age 13 onward, I would just send Steve McLean all kinds of text messages. I would just text him during the race, after the race, before the race, during the week. And I would just say, what's going on? And he explained all of these concepts to me in a way that helped accelerate my knowledge of the sport. Because imagine going into something, you have no idea what's happening. And all of a sudden you watch hundreds of hours of it per year, yeah. like thousands of hours of it per year. You're trying to catch up, but there's so only so questions. much. You can do. There are so many questions. And so Steve really helped me with that. As far as where Steve and I are at today, Steve and I are still buddies. I see him usually like once every couple of months. We go out to eat. We talk about NASCAR. Steve was a huge Dale Jr. fan, and he did not like Kyle Busch when I was a kid. He told me, <laughs> you could be a fan of anybody but Kyle Busch. That guy is a punk. And I actually told Kyle this. And I said, as you've gotten older, Kyle, he's now a fan. He cheers ah. for you. So. He turned around. This guy who was not a Kyle Busch fan is now cheering for Kyle Busch. And I'm Look like, at wow. that. Never say never. Never say never. What a turnaround. <laughs> I love that. That is a great story. Okay, it I have is. a question for you, Alanis. Okay, so if you're new to the show and if you follow Alanis on social media, she gets to drive oh all these amazing, <laughs> fun cars and um, so I want to, or this fan wants to know which press vehicle was the hardest to give back. Oh, so yeah, my, with my day job, I review cars. And so what happens is the automakers have a fleet deliver the cars to my driveway. 
and then they pick up the cars the next week. So I just have what a new car What do your neighbors think about driveway. this? Like, what's going on over here? Well, so what's interesting <laughs> is actually my neighbors will come up to me and they'll say, what is your husband? Where does your husband work? And my husband works in a public facing job where I live in a retirement neighborhood and older people really like to complain to my husband's job. And <laughs> so they come up to me and I'm like, oh, they're just confirming where he works so they can complain, right? That's what's going on. And then I tell them where he works and they go, oh, well, what's with the cars? And I'm on a completely different track, right? I'm like, I'm thinking they've got some complaints about the grass or the neighborhood or whatever. And yeah. then they're talking about the cars and I go, oh, those are mine. And they go, wait, your husband doesn't like flip them and sell them. And I'm like, no, no, those are mine. And so they I have to he's explain like a dealer to them. Or something. They think he's a dealer. And so I have to explain to them, no, those are my cars. And what's really funny is if we park the car somewhere, like we park the car somewhere and we're taking video or we're taking photos of it. People will go, oh, dude, that's a nice car. And he'll be like, no, that's my wife's car. And <laughs> it's always so funny to see them react to that. They're like, what? I that's love what? that. And so I would say which vehicle is the hardest to give back? They are all very hard to give back, especially the ones you just really, really love. Right now, I have a Honda Civic Type R. If you don't know about the Honda Civic Type R, it's a 300-ish horsepower hot hatch that only comes with a six-speed manual. It is a beautiful car. A couple of weeks ago, I had a Toyota GR Corolla, which is a similar setup, 300 horsepower, only six-speed manual. Oh, both of those cars just rip and you don't want to give them back, right? I would say the most jarring car to give back is a supercar. So if you spend a week in a McLaren 720S mm, or yeah. a Lamborghini Huracan, and then they come and they pick it up, they pick it up on a trailer so that it doesn't put miles on it, right? So they bring an 18-wheeler into my neighborhood, and then they put the car on the 18-wheeler. And then you go back in your own garage where we own two 2004 Mazda Speed Miatas and a Hyundai Elantra, and you're like, man... Which car is it going to be today? <laughs> and it's so jarring to go from a Lamborghini Huracan. Everyone's stopping. Everybody's yelling at you. Everybody's taking pictures. It's to probably so a smooth Mazda Speed too. Miata. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Lamborghinis are actually so ex oh, Lamborghinis. So there are a lot of supercars that are smooth. Lamborghinis and often those like high end Huracans, the racetrack Huracans, they are so rough it is like driving really? over a cheese grater yes and oh, so no my way. mom my mom assumed it would be really smooth too and she got in a huracan with me once and she was like this is awful <laughs> she did yeah because mentally i would think oh my gosh they would be just such a smooth sleek ride you know the suspension is so stiff because something like a huracan sto which is a four hundred thousand dollar car it's meant to be for the racetrack so it has that really stiff suspension when you're watching uh. the in-car camera on a race you see the driver is just like this that's what it's like inside a huracan sto and it's just ooh, it's rough in there but i really enjoy it but to go from all of the attention to the Miata or the Elantra is very, very jarring. So I would say <laughs> that's sometimes the hardest to give back because you know you're not the center of attention anymore. <laughs> Makes sense. Oh. And our next question is from T Downey 28. Hello. They said, I want to get my friends into NASCAR. What race should I take them to? Monica, do you want to go first? Yeah. So there are two, if I can say, two tracks. And they're two totally different tracks. One being we just came from Bristol. I mm -hmm. feel like if you are new to NASCAR and you walk into the Coliseum, and I feel like I've said this before, it's like a ha-ha, uh -huh, like, you know, you walk mm -hmm. into church. There is just this energy and feeling. There's not a bad seat in the house. You see everything that's going on. They've got a great interactive fan experience. So you get it all and it's all close by, right? So a lot of tracks you have to walk, do a lot of walking, but Bristol, everything is just kind of right there, which is so nice. Your friends will get hooked right away. I'm telling you. And then oh, I, think I know your next one. Well, I was going to say oh, Charlotte Motor Speedway. Yes. Oh, wow. Because you can go to yeah. all the race shops. I thought you were going to go yeah. to Talladega. No. I thought I, I had you. The Coca-Cola 600, the pre-race show, um, mm -hmm. when NASCAR salutes, very patriotic. There is no other pre-race experience like that. 
And to me, it just, it gets you hook, line, and sinker. And the racing is fantastic as well. Um, plus, you get the whole, yeah. I mean, you can go to all the race shops. They have fan fests. Good the, one. Everything in the Midway is very interactive at Charlotte. Um, so, yeah, those are my those are my two, I would say, to take a friend to. That is so good. I have yeah, a more vague you? response. <laughs> I have a more vague response, but also I'm struggling so much because my beautiful cat Portia is just staring me in the she's eyes. Singing. She's so cute. Um, I have a more vague response, which is literally any track that is near you that is financially feasible, mm. especially if the friends are not into NASCAR and they might they may go, I don't want to spend that much money to travel to a track. If you're near a track, just go. Now my one caveat to that would be it might be a little difficult for new people to understand the appeal if they go to a road course because the one drawback of road courses is that you can only see part of the track. Yeah. So you cannot see the full thing. You also don't have the echo of the cars in basically a giant aluminum bowl, which just really shows you how loud they are and how powerful they are. So I would recommend an oval, but if all you have near you is a road course, those are also really cool. And a new person will probably get a similar experience. I just went to an oval for my first race and it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen when the grandstands start rumbling and you're just like, yeah. this is ridiculous, right? This is earth shattering. That's what I would recommend. Just really get them there what, yeah. at whatever cost. And speaking of finances, uh, to be honest, if you do your research, there's a lot of tracks that offer 12 and under free. You can go in on a truck race or an Xfinity race. They're a little bit cheaper. I know Martinsville even is opening up this year, like a little grass area. Mm -hmm, um, and those tickets mm -hmm. are supposed to be cheaper. So I think Mentally, people were thinking, oh, man, it's way too expensive. But honestly, if you just do your homework and research and just look it up, you can find some feasible, some feasible tickets out there. Okay, so our next one is from Clutchless89. So Alanis, your all-time favorite NASCAR you pronounce that live, live livery. livery, livery, Monica, Monica loves <laughs> paint scheme. Is Monica is a true, literally true NASCAR girl. She's I like, what? Say paint Blue? scheme. Give me your paint, yeah, scheme. paint scheme. Love, these are too fancy of words for me. <laughs> and even, and even these days, because it's not really, it's really not paint anymore. They wrap it. I just yeah. go to scheme, right? Because right. I actually like to prevent people from going, well, actually it's this. So I used to say paint scheme, but now I just say scheme because I don't want someone to go, well, it's not paint. So I have to like <laughs> catch myself, right? So I can that use happens. this, the word though. I can still use, um, Alanis, what's your favorite NASCAR? Li I'm going to use Livery. it for the rest of the show. Library. Library. <laughs> Library. Okay. We're going, we're going very niche right now. So I'm very interested to hear Monica's answer. Extremely niche. I think it was 2000 and, ooh, I don't remember. It was early 2000s at the EA 500 at Talladega was the number 43 Yu-Gi-Oh car. Yu-Gi-Oh oh. is my favorite thing in the world. I love Yu-Gi-Oh. So often when, when you grew up in my generation, for anybody listening, when you grew up in my generation, you either watched Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh. And Pokemon was a much bigger <laughs> audience. Yu-Gi-Oh, Yu-Gi-Oh still had a huge audience, but it just wasn't as big as Pokemon. I was a Yu-Gi-Oh person. You say Pokemon? Yes. So I, I say Pokemon because people, everybody says Pokemon. That's what my kids say, Pokemon. Actor, so the voice actors for Yu-Gi-Oh! were a lot of the same voice actors for Pokemon. And the Japanese arm of the company would drill into their heads. It is not Pokemon. It is Pokemon. That's how you pronounce it. <laughs> so, things. And then I have Pokemon still happen. So I have friends who voice characters on current Pokemon. And when you talk to them, it's Pokemon. And then when I say Pokemon, other people are like, what? It's Pokemon. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like... It's Pokemon. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> so I was a Yu-Gi-Oh person and obviously I was not a NASCAR fan for this. So I didn't get to see it run live, but I've watched the race back, right? This car was so cool. It had all the Yu-Gi-Oh characters on it. It was awesome. Oh my goodness. And when the car went out for qualifying, Mike Joy was in the booth and Mike Joy was like, now we have the Yu-Gi-Oh car. <laughs> <laughs> 
me. I don't feel what as bad. Are? Even Mike Joy can't pronounce some things. Okay. All right. <laughs> so it's just really funny. It's a beautiful car. It's very niche, but I love it. Monica, what is your favorite? That's cool. Livery. 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 <laughs> just say paint. I'm so saying paint scheme. Okay. You got um, it. You got it. I I am going back to the iconic Dale Earnhardt Jr. number eight, the red Budweiser oh, yeah. scheme. Good one. To me, one. it is just, it, you look at it and you just think NASCAR. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's clean. You know, who doesn't like a Budweiser at the racetrack? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so it's, um, I, yeah, that's my favorite, all-time favorite. So, Wonderful fan questions. I love that we got to answer those. I love learning more about Monica every week. And I love just showing how bizarre I am every week. (laughs) Monica learned something new about me every single week. Today, when we... When we logged on, I somehow came up with the story about the time I bought like 300 slices of great value cheese. Um, <laughs> and Monica was like, what is going on? So we That's learn great. new things every single week. Today, though, our topic is road course specialists, which is so exciting and which is why we have AJ Allmendinger coming on the show. Now, who are some of our current road course specialists, the best road racers we know? One of them is my buddy, Tyler Reddick. We also have current era, people like Chase Elliott, Daniel Suarez. They really, really shine when they go to road courses. And then back in the old era, like the 2012 era, we had Marcus Ambrose. That guy was so good. And also in that time, I feel like Brad Kozlowski and Kyle Busch were really good at road course racing. And that was a time when people weren't as good at road course racing. The Cup Series only went to two road course races a year. So you really didn't need to focus on that skill. You needed to focus on ovals. We are now in an era where the Cup Series goes to like, what, six or seven at this yeah, point? Yeah, it used you to have- be Sonoma and Watkins Glen. Now it's we have and a wide it. range. And then you throw in Chicago Street street Race. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And people have gotten so much better at road course racing because they have to put more focus on it. Now it's a decent chunk of the schedule. And part of me sometimes does miss the days when no one cared about road course racing and they just went out there and they just did bowling pins for like three hours. (laughs) Oh my good. Part of me is like the good old days before anybody knew what they were doing. But part of me is like, this is nice. I like the race craft of the modern era. (laughs) Well, yeah, I think it's really cool to see. I I was part of NASCAR in those days when it was just two road courses a year. And it was really neat to see these guys were sweating bullets they you were know, sweating and, um, and wrecking. <laughs> they didn't really have a huge notebook uh, at these particular tracks. But like, yeah, like you said, these drivers are getting better and better. You have, you know, Shane Van Gisbergen coming over. You know, everybody probably is scared of him too this year. <laughs> Terrified. Oh, my goodness. And that also shows that when you run a certain type of track all the time, you get really used to that type of track. So Shane Van Gisbergen came over and made his Cup Series debut last year with the new Next Gen car, and he won in his debut on the Chicago Street Course. It was the first time in 60 years, since like 1963, that this had happened, but it was also the Cup Series' first ever street course. So when you look at someone like Shane Van Gisbergen, who has multiple Supercars championships, he runs road courses a lot. Whereas the Cup Series still, compared to him, did not run that many road courses. Now Shane's getting used to the ovals, and you see Shane learning the ovals. But he's not going to go out there and dominate it because that's not what he's done every single day for most of his life. You know, it's different yeah. skill sets. So it will be interesting to see as we head into Dakota this weekend. Speaking of Shane's yeah. teammate uh, and another, as you mentioned, amazing road course racer, AJ Allmendinger. He's got, what, 11 road course wins under his belt, which is unheard of. So he will be joining us on the show um, here in a little bit. Yay! AJ drives the number 16 car in the Xfinity Series, and he also runs part-time in the Cup Series. So we are so excited to talk to him about road course racing and Cup versus Xfinity and his cats. Yay, (laughs) AJ. Yeah, Alanis is a cat mom, so she cannot wait to talk cats with AJ. (laughs) We would like to welcome to the show one of my favorite drivers, am I allowed to say that? Number 16 Xfinity Series driver and, of course, Cup Series driver, A.J. Allmendinger. Woo! 
Thank you. I'll take my <laughs> bow later. Applause. That's so exciting. There you go. I, was gonna take my, I would take my bow now, but I'm actually taller sitting in a chair. So. <laughs> oh, I see. Stop it. I well, see. You know, I've got to ask about Arrow. I believe he's, is he six months old now? Yeah, just over six months. Yeah. How's he, that all uh, going? Because I see on your social media, you still have like cat dad on there. Don't you need to switch it over? I have, I have, dog. I have Arrow dad on yeah. there too. We okay. actually, I actually have to add the, the, uh, we, we have so many pets now and, and just, <laughs> just crazy things running through the house. I have to add Charlotte, which is the next, you know, the rescue cat that we just got a couple weeks ago. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Oh so, my goodness. Do you, you go shouldn't... outside and find them on the streets like me and just bring them in? I'm pretty sure that's what my <laughs> wife Tara does. Yeah. She's like, oh, oh my God. Like, no, her thing is, is always like our, like our neighborhood Facebook page. And they're like, oh, another cat got left. <laughs> and and she I'm goes like, and gets the cat. Her next thing she wants a she wants a a, a black green eyed cat. That's, I have a black me. green eyed cat. Her yeah. name's Portia. There you go. She's my angel. I found her outside on the street. I brought her inside. With Charlotte, because we we love crazy cat names. Charlotte, I guess, was already named, so we didn't want to change her name. So got it. I saw See, that whole story on her Instagram where she found her and I didn't know if you guys were going to keep her and then, okay. So you did end up keeping her. We did keep her. Yes. We were a little nervous at first because we thought she was a little standoffish with right. chicken nugget. And, um, <laughs> we, we realized that quickly that that's just how she liked to play and like chicken nuggets, actually the bully. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's, uh, she's been great. It, if you would have had an in-car footage of, my uh, Chevy Tahoe on the way home, driving through the mountains of Bristol. We had cats flying through the through the air as I was ripping it through the hills. Tara's holding on to them. Arrows you in the got back. Arrow. Yeah, yeah. It was, Zena, Zena was actually. I made Tara ride in the back. Zena got to ride up front with me, the the French bulldog. So yeah, that's it was, awesome. It was pretty comical. This sounds like my life. Like, oh my goodness, I just we got cats going around everywhere. We I named my cats after Shakespeare characters. So I have. Porsche, but people think it's Porsche as in Porsche the car, but it's really P O R T I A. So, you know, we have a theme just like you have a theme and it works. Yeah. It's, we just love a circus and a chaos. That's basically what we're going for. I love circuses and chaoses. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so you have had a really, really wide ranging career. You've raced all over the world. You've done open wheel stock cars, BMX, all kinds of stuff. I want to know more about that trajectory and also what you learned in these different disciplines that can help you currently. So the BMX started because my dad raced like these local dirt tracks. They were called Odysseys. They were like local, just small oval dirt track stuff. When I was like four or five, kind of right around four or five, my parents were looking to get me into racing and they used to have kids that raced like four wheelers, quad runners or at the racetrack. So my parents kind of thought, okay, that'll be easy. We're already there. That's what we're going to get AJ. And, uh, unfortunately the rate kind of right before we were about to get one, um, uh, my mom watched this kid kind of bicycle into the wall and unfortunately it paralyzed the kid. Oh, so man. my, my mom was like, okay, we're not doing that. And uh, I was always riding my bike around the neighborhood, and we saw a flyer at uh, this hobby shop that said BMX bike racing at, at this local racetrack that was near us. And that's honestly how I started BMX bike racing. And up to that point, my favorite form of racing, and really still to this day, is Supercross. I love mm -hmm, Supercross. Yeah. I love motocross. Uh, you know, the, the, the Jeff Stantons and the Ricky Johnsons, uh, the Jeremy McGrath, and part of my TV – career the the small career that i had on tv for nbc the coolest thing was to go to the meadowlands and and call the supercross race with ralph shaheen and ricky carmichael yeah. like that to me was the coolest thing ever so i just wanted to race supercross and i raced bmx for like three years and my mom i was like okay i'm ready for a motorcycle and she was like the hell you are no like, way not, <laughs> not happening so we went the four-wheel route and that's kind of that's kind of how it all carding and, and up through the ranks so i've been very fortunate that I've gotten to, to race a lot of different forms of, of cars, uh, go to a lot of really cool places, you know, been able to win in, in most of the things that I've been in. Of course, you always want to win more, but, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty special because I don't think there's a lot of people that can say they've won 
cup races. They've won IndyCar races. They've won Rolex, stuff like that. And uh, just very fortunate that I've had people that want me to drive the race cars and the friendships that I've made through that of, of the Mike Shanks and, uh, you know, Matt Collins, Chris Rice is now and, and, you know, people like being able to drive for Roger Penske and Richard Petty, like just legends. So I've been yeah. very lucky. Yeah, you've yeah. had great experiences. I mean, California kid, your dad raced. I love your dad, by the way. He's hysterical. He's always at the racetrack. He's always just cheering you on, AJ. He's like your biggest supporter. Um, and I know you're talking about, you know, you were going to get behind the wheel at ages like four and five, and you've raced all these different series, but did you ever see the Cup Series in your future? Was that always like the ultimate goal for you? As a kid, I just wanted to, to race cars professionally like that's like I, I didn't have for a while it was it was NASCAR and then as I was going through karting and kind of the open wheel ranks really what would kind of change the direction of, of what I was doing and, and got my name recognized was Paul Tracy which you know at the time of when I was 17 he was a huge star in in cart and in champ car and he had started a, a go-kart team and asked me to drive for it and that's kind of how my name started getting recognized a little bit so being able around him and, and a lot of the the champ car guys the jimmy vassars alex taglianis patrick carpentiers those guys uh you know it just i was around champ car and i was like man i just want to be a part of this like this is where our, where i'm gonna go uh but it was never like this is the end all the, yeah. the one thing that i could have went to the red bull driver search the, the first one that they did that that, you know, really were Scott Speed, and that's how he got mm -hmm. to Formula One. Uh, I was a part of that. I was kind of the, the lead guy of doing that, but I just never really wanted to go live in Europe. And that was kind of my thing was I was an American kid. I loved being here in the U.S. I loved Champ Car. I always felt like if I did well in Champ Car and Formula One was – was the place that I had an option to go with a good team. Like it was still going to happen. So I turned down that driver search, but uh, was very fortunate that, you know, champ car was happening. But the problem was, was both series were split. It was champ car and IRL. And they were just kind of, they were just kind of killing each other at that time. And champ car looked like it was going to die. And IRL, I didn't know what that was going to look like. And my team owner that I was driving for was definitely not going to the uh, going to, to the merge series if it happened he was he hated tony george and he was done with them and i was a, a red bull driver and next thing you know they started a nascar team and that's how i found myself in in nascar i remember oh, that was oh. that in like oh seven it was like oh yeah it was really oh six my last year in champ car was oh six and you know i in my mind that when they were starting the team i thought okay like i'll run trucks and and i'll run you know, Xfinity or Bush series back then, but you know, and I'd get some experience and they'll put some experience guys in the first year. And then if I do well, I'll move up. And that was my plan. And their plan was, Hey, let's go right to cup. And I was like, well, that doesn't seem very smart, but <laughs> you're not going to turn it down. No. So that's, that's what you I have did. to and seize spent, the opportunity. Yeah. That is so true. Also, and there's Porsche, Porsche is alternating. By the way. Yeah, she's alternating between <laughs> hitting the microphone and trying to eat the granola bar that I was halfway through when AJ joined. She's trying to eat the granola bar right now. She's our mascot on the show. She's our mascot, and she's just over there eating it. But I think that's fair about moving to Europe. I think moving to another country can be kind of freaky because you have to learn all this new stuff. But I want to know, as a kid, you had dreams of being a race car driver. What would little AJ think about what big AJ has done? Uh, it's, uh, I think he would be thrilled with <laughs> what I have done. The problem is, is the AJ now is exactly like the little kid AJ <laughs> and nothing's good enough. And that's true. Like it's to this, I, I, I tell Tara all the time right now that, I wish there was like 10% of me mentally that could just not be as competitive in my own head with myself just because I would be happier in life. Yeah, like it yeah. really would be. But this is what I tell people all the time. I'm like, I'm so fortunate in my life that 
I'm still getting paid to drive race cars at 42 years old. I've never had to bring money. I've never, cause I've never had any money to bring. So that's the one that was, my parents mortgaged the house three times when I was in just started car racing. So we were wow. tapped out of money. Uh, but for, you know, 22 years, I've been paid to drive race cars. It never stood out to me until last year, or maybe the first year that, uh, Daniel Hemrick was my teammate and I love Daniel so much. Like we become such good friends, but he made a comment. We we're flying to a race one day. He's like, how long have you been paid to drive race cars? And I was like, <laughs> what do you mean? He's like, like how, when it, like how long has somebody handed you a check to drive a race car? And I was like, I don't know, 21 years. He's like, that's awesome. And I was yeah. like, it never like, yeah. it never hit me in my own head. I was like, well, that is pretty awesome. No, it really is. I mean, and I've seen your interviews too, where you always say like, you know, I'm just, I'm in my head. But the thing is, is, is you're so driven, right? I mean, if you don't have that passion or if you take a, I feel like if you, you say, if I could just take 10% out, then I, then I feel like the passion kind of dies down. Right. I mean, if you still get yeah. like for me behind a microphone, if I still get like a little nervous or a little excited, I still love it. And it's still in my blood. The moment I'm like, eh, who cares? It's game over. Before every race. I honestly feel like I'm going to puke. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm nervous. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to struggle. I don't want to suck. I like, I want to be at my best. I want my race team to be happy with my performance, everything about it. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, my, my saying is I have the best life in the world. And it's why I'm miserable every day because <laughs> it's not good enough. I just want to be better. Well, it's cause you care, you know, and I yeah. need to know too, like the double duty, right? H how do you do that? As far as Mentally, you're having to take notes from the Xfinity side, the cup side, you know, physically you're jumping in from car to car. It's just, you know, are you just exhausted Monday? I mean, how do you prep for like a long weekend like that? We'll have a lot of races this year where I do end up doing both races. Uh, you know, the the cars are, are a lot different now. That's what's the hardest thing now. I think back in the day when, when a lot of cup guys would run the Saturday races, the, the cars were similar. So you were learning a lot just to be able to take over to the, the Sunday race. These cars are so different now. You don't learn really anything setup wise. You do learn tendencies of the racetrack. You can still kind of help that uh, on a Sunday after learning Saturday. I always still feel like laps are laps. Like the more laps you run, the better you are. If it goes well on Saturday, you're happier when you wake up on Sunday. Yeah. Like that's just a part of it. But yeah, uh, you know, I'm 42 years old. It it hurts a little bit more on Monday when you run both races. Um, but I love the challenge of it. You just got to prepare each week. It, you can't do it once you get to the weekend, hydrating and, and trying to take care of yourself leading up to that uh, is probably more important than ever now, especially at, at my age, trying to do that. So, but it's just part of it. It's, yeah. it's not, uh, you know, I'm not doing anything else that, that other guys don't do either. So, like with our team at, at Collard Racing, the Saturday races, you know, we know those are, are more of our chances to win, you know, and that's primarily why Chris and Matt wanted me back in the Xfinity Series is, is to go try to win races and, and win a championship. The cup side of it, you know, we're, we're I think we're just trying to find our way of, of what we want to be. And, you know, road courses, we want to, we have a chance to run up front, you know, places like Bristol, I think if you can run, you run top 10, that's a great day. You run top 15, that's a solid day. And just really trying to build the program. Yeah, especially after this past weekend, all we hear about is tire wear, tire fall off, oh. resin on the track. Yeah. Oh that was my wild. goodness. This, this past weekend was wild. And my husband actually last night, literally a minute and 15 seconds before his iRacing League race in the truck series last night at Bristol, his wheel stopped working. It stopped working and he had to be in the grid. And so he had to hook up his Xbox controller and this poor man, they were showing his in-car on the broadcast and it looked like he was in the cup race with those oh tires, <laughs> but he was the only one. He was the only one on those tires because he was just doing that joystick and the wheel was just twitching. I felt so bad for him. In he finished south. 17. <laughs> in the South, we say, bless his heart, bless his heart. Okay. So we talked about cars and I want to talk more about the difference between the the Xfinity car and the cup car later, because that fascinates me. But first I want to talk about teammates and just the array of people you have at colleague racing, including yeah. Shane Van Gisbergen, who for listeners won his cup series debut at the Chicago street course last year and is now making a career in NASCAR. 
Do all of y'all lean on each other a lot or do you take a more individualistic approach? Yeah, so I've always, ever since I've, I've come to call it racing, you know, I, I've tried to make it a point that I'll do anything I can for my teammates in the sense of, uh, you know, whether it's just talking and going over the racetrack and things like that or, or helping at sim or any, you know, anything that they need me to do, I'm willing to help uh, because especially what Matt and Chris have allowed me to feel is, is part of this team of the success that we've had building together is that, you know, anybody wins at college racing, we all win. And, and I take that to heart. So uh, I can take a lot of pride in, in, you know, especially like when Justin Haley would win the races and uh, you know, Jeb won the race for us, uh, obviously Ross won the first race and, and that was my first race with the team. I've always opened myself up to helping them, but I've never, I'll never force myself on you. Like, I'm not going to seek you out to say, Hey, what do you need? Like, but my, my door, my quote unquote door is always open. So whatever it takes to kind of help, you know, and, and each person is different. Shane, we talk a lot at the racetrack, you know, he's learning the oval side of it. Uh, I think on the road courses here, he'll probably be the guy <laughs> to beat because he's that good. I mean, the guy is world-class. You don't win just three supercar championships in Australia just because you know you're, you're okay like the right, talent yeah. over there is phenomenal so he's learning the oval side of it he'll pick it up quick and he already is showing that he is um, but yeah it that's always been then my motto is just like whatever you guys need I'll be there but I'm not gonna force myself on you colleague seems like such a great fit for you I know Alanis was mentioning you know all the fun personalities with of course Chris Rice we've seen him Take his shirt off in the garage. Yeah, doing we, a little they, dance. trying to stop that, by the way. <laughs> like, you gotta end that. I don't know. Go. I really don't know why that started. Like, <laughs> it, it started at Talladega when we won a couple I years remember. ago. I don't know who, like, <laughs> like told him, like, let's do this. It's great. Um, I can promise you, nobody from our team has ever said, "Please take your shirt off." So we're working on that. He's but given yes, he's the a fun fans. He's given the yeah. fans what they want. Yeah, he he took that thing off at Talladega and gave it to somebody, and he was like, "I'll sign that." And I'm like, <laughs> "Why? Why would? Why would you want this sweaty? It was great. Sweaty. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, anyway, it was great. Yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, he he does his little dance, and and he's he's just a funny funny personality. But it does seem like a good fit for you over there. It seems like everybody has your back and if and it seems like you have really found your stride over there um what is your feeling on on college racing yeah i mean it's it's something that i wasn't really expecting right like i thought i was going to my next career in, in tv and next thing you know chris actually was the one that made the call and i knew who he was i'd never talked to him uh i had never spoke to matt or even been close to Matt Collig at all. I'd seen what Collig Racing was doing in the Xfinity Series for a couple of years, but next thing you know, a couple of races has turned into, you know, six years now. And and I think we've won 17 races together, two of them being cup races. Like it, it they've, they've allowed me to achieve a lot of things that I didn't think was going to happen. I mean, I've been able to kiss the bricks uh, twice. I, so that was cool. something I've dreamed my whole life about was doing that. Uh, you know, win a couple more cup races to win races on ovals. It's a, it's a great organization in the sense like they allow me to be me and Matt and Chris will be the first ones to tell you, I'm probably a fun personality to be around, but when it's not going well, I'm not a good person to be around. Like I will tell you that. And, but when I say it, I say, we all suck. Like yeah. I'm the first, I'm leading it. I'm, I'm leading it. So it starts with me, but all of us together, like I, I will, they, I think they, they wanted me to be full time just because they got annoyed at me not being full time because every race I'd be blowing their phone up middle of the race. Like, <laughs> Hey, your cars are terrible. We got to make these things better. Like, we got to get, get this man's phone away. And from they him. were like, we got to get him, like, at least get him in the car. Like, get him in the car. Him. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, but yeah, they, they allow me to be who I am, the good and the bad. And I love that. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a great time that we have a lot of stories that we can share and there's definitely a lot that we can't share. Yeah. That's oh, understandable. And you mentioned kissing the bricks at, um, at Indy in the brickyard and you know, you've had several road course wins. Is there one that's a little bit sweeter than the other? I mean, Indy will be special, uh, because 
it, it's it's indie. I mean, it's something that I dreamed about, but it was strange because it was unexpected. I was I still remember that weekend. Like I thought we were going to win the Xfinity race. We were so quick during that race. Bad strategy call. You know, we kind of we took the points at the end of stage two. Which it's kind of funny as you look back at it because if we didn't take those points, we don't win the regular season championship. But it, in the moment, it cost us a win at Indy. So I was so disappointed that night. And, you know, the cup car was okay, but it wasn't race winning. And it was just a struggle of a race. And then, you know, with the the chicane and how it all happened. And then uh, so to win that race and be able to kiss the bricks, uh, like I remember laying on the back straightaway at two thirty in the morning, just like laying there and, and like, you know, some tears coming out, trying to figure out what the heck just happened. Then at five thirty, I went back out there and I threw up because I drank too much with Chris <laughs> and Matt that night. So uh, <laughs> I'm walking the back straightaway several times. Yeah. Uh, but, you We're know, back straightaway when it yeah. sees you coming. It is but, like, please. Yeah, it's like stay away from me. Uh, but you know, I think last year the the Roval was and you know for who saw the race saw my emotions we had put so much work into that that race for about a month because we knew that that was an opportunity we could go win the race it's tough to win cup races right yeah. like it's sometimes you just take it for granted like oh yeah you know you, you do the right things you're gonna win a race no that's everything has to go right especially for a team like ours where you just you got to execute all day so i just remember for a month, myself and the engineers and, and my crew chief squid at the time, you know, we just, that's all we worked on. We just started skipping other races, basically, like, this is our chance to win. And we went out and executed and did everything right and won that race. And I think that's why those emotions were so high, because it's just tough to win those races. And, uh, and we did everything right. And it's, it's fun to say that, like, when you've executed, I felt like I drove every lap almost as perfect as I could drive the pit stops they execute everything about it was just it was perfect and and that's why i think it meant so much yeah the stars aligned for sure that day i was in victory lane that day when you won and i think it's important too for the race fans to see that raw emotion after a win like that i mean it just shows you know how much you care about it and um that was really cool you know being in charlotte too i know daytona is is nascar's home but also of course charlotte so that that's cool to win there yeah and we just had arrow and that was cool. Yeah. Unfortunately, he went Tara, Tara and Arrow weren't there. He was a little too young, but yeah, to be able to come home and see that it was, it was, uh, it, it meant a lot for so many reasons. We were talking double duty earlier, and you know, I know AJ likes to do double duty sometimes, sometimes. and we're going sometimes, yeah. and we're going to Coda. I think you got a big weekend ahead, AJ. Anything you want to share with us? Most of the time, I, I find out from Bob whether I'm running double duty or not. There we go. He usually knows before I do. So, yeah, it's uh, double duty. We'll be, a, we'll be a third car on the cup side of it, and uh, it'll be cool because we'll have the leaf filter paint scheme on there, which I've only ever had the leaf filter paint scheme one time in my life, yeah. and that was at Mid-Ohio. Uh, I think the maybe the first time I raced Mid-Ohio, which is Matt Collick's home racetrack, so – Justin Haley and I both ran a leaf filter car, but yes, the iconic leaf filter colors that have been synonymous with Collig Racing and Matt Collig. So that'll be pretty special. So we'll be in the 13 car. All right. Uh, Exciting. My, my goal, ultimately, I told uh, C. Rice that at some point, Josh Williams and I have to switch cars during the year in Xfinity. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to run every number that Collig Racing's ever had. I think that's, that's a great idea. Goal. I like that a lot. Yeah. I think that's, that's cool. wonderful. This yeah. could be the lucky 13. So, you know, it's it's a good number. I, I agree. So. We're going to try to make it the lucky 13. Uh, the Coda has been great for me in the Xfinity side, and it's been heartbreaking for me on the cup side of it. So we're going to try to fix that on the cup side. Let's change Here it we around. Go. We're going to give you, you know, good energy going into this weekend. But no, that's exciting. Thanks for sharing it here on Mike's Our Hot. AJ Allmendinger is doing double duty this weekend in Coda. And oh my gosh, Monica and Krista know that I have been looking forward to this episode for weeks because road course racing is just like my nerdy spot. So I'm so excited to just ask you a bunch of the nerdiest questions I could possibly come up with about road course racing. <laughs> my first one is we are headed to Circuit of the Americas this weekend where you're going to run both races. You got Xfinity 
and cup. I want to walk through what about that track clicks for you because you are very good there. And I also want to walk through the trouble spots, the spots you have to know what you're doing and anticipate things on that track. Yeah, it's just a, a flow of a racetrack. Like you, you, I think you look at certain road courses and they kind of align as like a Sonoma. It's a slow racetrack. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of slow first, second gear corners. Uh, you look at a road America where a lot of the corners are high speed. Uh, I Coda just kind of brings everything. You got oh, the yeah. flowing S's, you got tight hairpins, you know, with the Xfinity cars, tire wear is a big deal. So trying to not burn off your tires. Uh, you know, I think there's trouble spots all around the racetrack, but the biggest thing is, is the hairpins and stuff to not, you can get yourself in so deep and, and start locking tires up and things like that. And, and, you know, there's a lot of runoff, so you don't sometimes pay the price. So per se of, of going off the racetrack, but it's definitely a racetrack that uh, is easy to make a mistake. And then once you make a mistake, you get out of rhythm and then it yeah. just feels like it snowballs from there. Oh yeah. That makes total sense. I would say the most stressful part of Coda for me is I always think turn 11 is a lot faster than it is. And I always think turn 19 is a lot slower than it is. Yeah. And every time I come out of one of those turns, I'm like, ah, I knew that. I, I knew that. Why did I do that? Anyway, back to my nerdy questions. Here we go. So you are very good at road courses. You're also very good at ovals. You got both of these skills together, right? And I really want to know, as someone who has only driven road courses, road courses feel more like a rubric to me. When you go into a corner, you take the wide entry, you go in, hit the apex, go out wide to carry the most speed. Whereas when you watch an oval race, you can run the high line, you can run the low line, you can run the middle line. Am I correct in saying that an oval is just kind of more subjective. You have more options. Whereas a road course, given good weather and you're the only person on track, there <laughs> is a science to it. Uh, I mean, I think there's, everything's got a science to it. It's, True. you know, oval racing. I think at times, that's what I love about road course racing. A driver mm -hmm. can make a little bit of difference at times, you know, oval mm -hmm. racing, you can't do, don't get me wrong. You watch Kyle Larson or Tyler Reddick rip the fence. I, I, you know, I'm in awe, like mm -hmm. <laughs> jealous i'm jealous <laughs> i'm in awe i it's fun to watch i hate watching it because they're usually faster than me when they do it <laughs> uh, but there's a science to that too but road course racing to me is about always picking out what's important about the corner mm -hmm. you know is you if you go into a hairpin corner the break zone is the most important thing because at at certain point everybody's going to be down to whatever mile per hour that corner is but if i can carry 50 feet later before yeah. i hit the brakes that's so much lap time but, you know, what does that corner lead to? Is that a long straightaway? Well, I can't just give up the exit of the corner because now I, I get punished all the way down the straightaway. So to me, a road course is always about picking out, okay, what's a, important about this corner and how do I maximize this corner for, for whatever that is? Uh, and that's why I really enjoy it because it's, it's a lot of thought that you put into, of okay, you know, picking out each part of the racetrack. You know, you look at Coda, there's 20 corners. So there's, you know, you got to look at every corner and what that corner leads to and what's important about that corner and figure that out and try to maximize that for, for, you know, 20 corners in a lap that's mm -hmm. over two minutes long. There are 20 quarters at Coda, but the S's, you can kind of go a little straight through yeah. and NASCAR, NASCAR has curbed that by adding some track limits in there. But compared to other racing series at Coda, NASCAR is just like drive wherever you want. We don't care. You don't have to stay within the lines generally. How do, what are your thoughts on track limits? Do you think track limits should exist? Do you like just being able to fan out five wide and do whatever you want? <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. So it's, I would, if I had to pick one or the other, I would pick what we do at Coda Me compared too. to what formula one does <laughs> yeah. because it, it's <laughs> trying to figure that out. Every corner is really annoying. Mm -hmm. Now the yeses, is, I'm not going to lie. I wish there was a little bit of curbing because For it's sure. so subjective of of what you think is happening compared to what maybe NASCAR thinks and the penalty for it is huge. So yes. I do wish we had some, some curbing there. So there was, so you couldn't just drive across it, but it's the same for everybody. You know, it's uh, every driver's looking at the guy in front of him going, well, how's that not cutting? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's, so it's a part of it, but I would still rather have what we have than, you know, you watch a guy put a phenomenal lap in and he hung 
you know, the last mm -hmm. eighth of his tire just over the curbing the wrong way. And now he's got the lap taken away. Yeah, that's yeah. quite annoying in Formula One. I can't stand it. I think you're so right about curbing in the S's because the thing about the S's is that it's so tempting to just carry so much speed through them. But if you carry too much speed and you go over that track limit, it's kind of over. Like there's such a blurred line. So I think curbing could really help. Yeah. It, so the first year there was, there was like a, they had, it wasn't a full blown turtle. It was a little <laughs> bit of a curbing that they had. And I thought that made it easier to, to know. And, and if, the problem is, is because in open wheel racing, you, it's hard to run through their side by side because you touch wheels. It's, it, it mm -hmm. ends bad for both people yeah. most of the time. You know, we got doors, so we use them and you get shoved off the racetrack and you get penalized for it. Uh, I get that. Or, or you get really shoved into a curb and you bounce over the top of it and it wrecks a race car. So I understand why they're not there. I, I do just wish there was something there because it it's such a borderline every lap and it's a lot of lap time. If you get yeah. it right, I mean, it, you can make up half to three quarter second through there, but it's such a fine line and, and you miss it just a little bit. And NASCAR makes you drive down pit road. But like I said, it's the same for everybody. So you just gotta, you gotta figure it out. Wind socks on either side. Yeah. Wind <laughs> socks. That would be good. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think we should take a break from Alanis's nerdy time to do yeah, rapid fire. And I'm going to let Monica do our rapid fire questions. Okay. We'll wrap this up with some rapid fire. Okay. Real quick. Have you ever worn socks with sandals? Be honest. Uh... I'm sh I probably have, honestly. I do, I'm not a big sandal person. I do it all the time. I'm not a big sandal person, so I don't know. No, but no. But I probably have, yeah. It's oh, I do, it, I do it all the time. The yeah. worst thing is when you put on the sandals and you have socks on, and I forget because it's just like second nature to me, and I go out and drive one of our cars, and my foot slips on the clutch because I have socks and sandals on. Yeah, don't no. recommend. No. Yeah, don't recommend. <laughs> okay. If you could afford any car, which one would you drive? Good question. So I've never been a huge car guy, but I think if I had to have one, like any type of Ferrari that, cause that was in, in the background to that really quick, I know it's rapid fire, but really quick is the fact that when I was, you know, four or five years old, my mom and I would always walk near where, uh, where we lived and they had a Ferrari dealership. And I used to always look at it. I always told my mom I was going to get her a Ferrari. Aww. Um, I, I, I got a, that. I, I didn't, I didn't get her a Ferrari. I bought her a couple of cars, but it was not a Ferrari. She couldn't handle that. But yeah, if I was going to get one, it'd be any type of Ferrari. I love that. That is so cool. Okay. Last one. The weirdest thing your pet, or one of your pets, what's the weirdest thing one of your pets does? Uh, now, uh, so chicken nugget. We, so when we had Mr. Tickles, Tara, we, <laughs> I, we, we paid for it, but it was Tara's idea that we had to screen in the porch. We call it the catio. Uh-huh, catio. So tickle, Tickles would just chill on it. Well, as soon as we brought Chicken Nugget home, one day she we'd let her out on the catio, and I couldn't find her. I'm like, where the heck is this cat? And she's small. And I looked up, and she'd climbed to the top of the, the catio. No so way. So that was the weirdest thing. I'm like, what the heck is this cat that we got? Like she'd <laughs> literally climbed to the top of, of the catio and I had to like get a chair and grab her and pull her down. Sometimes they do these things yeah. and you just don't know they had the ability to do that. And you're yeah. like, where did that come from? So that's yeah, that's, awesome. that's probably what, she, and we, she still tries to do it, but at least we've calmed her down a little bit. <laughs> so two I two different personalities. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely love this. This was half car talk and half cat talk. Thank you so much, AJ, for joining Mics Are Hot. We're going to end on our final question that we ask everyone. What fuels you? Uh, I'm scared to fail. There we go. I love that's that. It. I'm just scared to fail in my life, what I consider failing, and that's what mm -hmm. drives me every day. I love it. Wow. Awesome. Thank that you so much for joining sink. us, AJ. We appreciate it. Thank yes. you, ladies. That was fantastic. I absolutely loved talking to AJ. How about you? I love it too. And I love that he gives so much insight on the technical aspect because he's had so much experience. I mean, over 20 years running, starting BMX and now, you know, all the way up through NASCAR. So it was great to get some insight from him. But we're heading to Dakota this weekend. I believe a little birdie told me you're going to be there too. I am. And you know what? 
AJ was talking about his Bob tweets and I was so looking forward to getting a Bob tweet for being on the roster, but I'm not on the official roster because I'm an additional spotter because this weekend at Coda, I am spotting for Brad Perez with Yay! Alpha Prime Racing. And I'm so excited. I will be in the stadium section of Coda, which is you have that long back stretch and then you have the sharp corner of turn 12 and then you okay. like snake around a little bit and then you go around the tower that's the stadium section. So I will be right there telling Brad what cars are around him, how to be careful, what to do. It's my first time ever spotting. I am so excited. I'm going to write an ESPN story about it and I'm going to make a YouTube <laughs> video about it. There will be so much information about how to be a spotter. I'm just so sad that I don't get a Bob tweet because I'm not on the official roster. Well, you know what? You can find Bob Pockers while you're there and get your selfie made. You can tweet him out. Okay, see, I was thinking, I was like, should I just text Bob and say, Bob, <laughs> Bob, can you announce that I'm spotting? <laughs> Go for but it's it. Not, Why not? It, it has to be natural, right? Like Bob has to, Bob has to naturally do this. So well, here, maybe I'll get a Bob tweet. Bob okay. is the first one there. Everybody knows that in the media center, right? So you just get there, 530 in the morning, you'll get your Bob tweet. <laughs> okay that's actually an idea i get a piece of printer paper and in sharpie i write alanis is spotting for the 45 car and i just put it on a desk in the media center there you go and then we can maybe get like go. a social media poll going and everybody's like you know rooting there for you and waiting for this bob tweet to happen I am so excited for this weekend. If you want to listen, if you go on NASCAR.com and you make an account, you can go on the Race Center page for the Xfinity Series and you can play everyone's radio. So if you want to hear me spot, you can just go on there and play the 45 radio and it will be me and Brad Perez and my husband and the team owner, Tommy Joe Martins, and we will be spotting for Brad as he goes around the track. That's awesome. We'll be sure to tune in. Best of luck to you, Alanis, this weekend. Have so much fun. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Mics Are Hot.